Hello, welcome to the first ever episode of the Southbound Sports Podcast. This is going to be a weekly podcast where we talk about issues and topics in the sporting world. Today we are going to take a look at the Orange Bowl uh, that just happened last week or so and give our thoughts on that. It was a game between the Florida State Seminoles and the Michigan Wolverines. It ended up being a one-point battle down the stretch. It was a pretty exciting game. So this is what you can look forward to expecting from us. I interview Matty B. We kind of just talk back and forth a little bit on the game. And I will be your host, Richie Leahy, for the podcast. So look for us. We're going to be submitting this to uh, most major podcast networks. And looking forward to having some of you listen in. Here, without any further ado, the first interview on the Orange Bowl with Maddie B. Enjoy. All right, here on Southbound Sports, jumping into it with Maddie B. I want to talk Orange Bowl. It's been a while, so we're not, it's not close to the end of the game. It's been a few weeks uh, to let me sit and think about it. But what are your thoughts, initial thoughts on the game? Well, of course, being a, being a Knowles fan, I was very pleased with the end result. Um, the earlier start of the game, I was really surprised with with how well offensively Florida State came out. Earlier in the year, they seemed to have some issues with drive stalling, getting stopped, and then playing from behind. And it was it was actually nice and reminded me of some of the, the Glory Day seminal games where we jumped out ahead and kind of maintained the lead. I wish they would have maintained it and not let it get as close as what it got, but, but I was still pretty overall happy with, with how they played. Were you nervous at the end there? Oh, When Evans ran that touchdown? When he scored, I thought that was game because I thought when, when, when the Knowles got the ball back, had they have had – the typical Florida State drive, it would have been late turnover. The, it would have been over. But I think that the kickoff, the ensuing kickoff after the touchdown, completely changed the way that it was going to play out. Because by getting the ball past midfield, it, it created – it was such a momentum changer that they, they drove right down and, and got the go-ahead. Yeah, and that was what I was thinking too. Um, because I was traveling while I was watching it, listening to it. And our kicker all year have, has been great at, like, just kicking it out of the end zone. So I don't know if that was, like, a decision where uh, the coach said just hang it up and maybe try to make him return it, and it backfired, or if he just didn't get all, all of the ball. But it kind of, like, hung up there, like, the one or two yards deep in the end zone. He stumbled at first. He didn't know if he should even take it out. And then as soon as they got the long return, I figured uh, it's going to be over, either a touchdown or a field goal. Field goal would have what, sent it to overtime? I don't remember the score exactly. But I figured that it was going to come down to something to put them back into the game, and it wasn't over at that point. Now, what did you think of Michigan's play calling from an offensive standpoint? Well, I think at the beginning of the game, um, I think the Peppers, when he went out, that game time decision really hurt them because it looked like they weren't planning for that. Like, that wasn't something that I heard that, like, hey, he might not play. And you could tell because, like, the defensive shifts on that long touchdown, we never played zone, like, all year. So, like, that was something that I think if Peppers is in the game, not saying the Knowles don't score on a long touchdown, I just think that the calling's different, and I think that that made the offense more conservative. And we don't have a run game. Like, it it might not be the line. I, I don't like blaming players. But like the running backs don't cut. Evans coming into the game was a huge like game changer. As soon as he went in, he had the speed to match up with Florida State, and he was able to get to the second level. But up until that point, when we made the change, there was nothing happening, which I assumed because I predicted a low-scoring game like 9-6, to six, even though it didn't go out like that. And it was even closer than my three-point pick em as a one-point win. But that basically was a three-point win. If you don't count that blocked extra point, <laughs> which <laughs> well, didn't even mean anything. But as soon as he returned it, I was like, all that means is now if we get a miracle kickoff return or a long pass to set up a field goal, that we would win before the chance. And that would have been a heartbreaking way to lose for Florida State after taking that late lead. Absolutely. 
I was really surprised at Michigan's in relying as heavily as they did on their heavier packages. It seems like with the speed that they have, Michigan was moving the ball well when they went into some of some more of their spread, whether it was under center or from the gun. If they if, if they stayed in some of those wider spread them out it was giving them the running back some lanes where i think when they started going with the two tight ends and the i the pro i it was the the same running lanes really weren't there yeah and i think i don't know if it want, has to do with our offense changed dramatically whenever grant newsom went down with a knee injury like if you look at how the like our offense was manhandling everybody, and he's our left tackle, and you know how important a left tackle is. But about midseason, he went out for the rest of the year, and ever since then, we struggled. That's whenever we get into the Iowa game. We can't maintain the line, and I don't know if throwing in these heavy packages is a reflection on that, like we just have our lines too young. And I know they talk about us losing a lot of seniors this year, but realistically, we were rotating in a lot of true freshmen. Like even Evans, I'm pretty sure, was a true freshman uh, running back. And then you lose Jake Butt, who is basically our best run blocking and pass catching tight end. And I don't know if it was just too much to overcome. And we had to switch to those wide open plays. But I know that the line hasn't been the same. And I'm hoping with some of the great recruiting uh, gets we got this year that it's going to change that and we'll have more depth on the line. And that sounds pretty good. I mean, I, I, I definitely think with how offenses are changing now and you're starting to see more like spread or run pass option type plays, I think that that can be something to help neutralize issues with your line where you maybe you run an inside zone or a power play to the middle and have your more athletic guys on the outside for screens or quick passes that it, it may be something to help you help out with a, a young offense or a young or an inexperienced offensive line kind of having some easy tags for, for your play so that all that pressure isn't placed on those outside guys. Cause I know from Florida state, it seems like with the teams that ran more of those spread concepts, they really had some issues getting defensive stops. I mean, you saw it with Louisville, you saw it with NC state, you saw it with Houston in the bowl game, the, pr- the previous year, I mean, those teams that, that run those hurry up, no huddle type offenses really give them a hard time. Yeah. And I don't know if it's something that's going to be like just a recruiting. It's going to take time to get in because it's only a second year and we did have a lot of transfers. That one class that we had was only like 15 guys. I think that's our going to be our juniors next year. And I don't know. Like I like Harbaugh is always balanced. Even at Stanford, when he had Andrew Luck, he was throwing in Wildcat doing the heavy and mixed stuff. I just don't think that he has his packages yet as much as the pundits want to say that this was the year to go deep into the playoffs. I just don't think it was because like two years ago when he got hired, they were saying we were going to be six and six followed by an eight and four year this year. And he passed both of those up. So I don't know if it's just because of his great coaching staff that the expectations are too high, but going forward, I think it's going to be different. Like, this is going to be his main year of his recruits. Everyone's going to be young next year. Uh, People are already saying that that Florida State-Michigan game might be a rematch for a potential playoff matchup next year. What do you think about the Knowles in regards to that? I would be happy with that. I I have been doing some reading early on, and a lot of the the preseason, way-too-early things are saying that Florida State's the number one, number two-ranked team. Um I think with having their quarterback returning, with having a lot of the skill guys back, I I think it's justified. I think it's good. They looked good, and they had um, some nice young depth coming in. Uh, I've been doing some recruiting breakdowns. I'm going to throw it up on the research section on Southbound Sports, uh, looking at a different way to analyze preseason rankings for college based off um, maybe opponent records and... I know they. I sent you some stuff on the blue chip ratio and the actual complete talent roster component, which doesn't, like if you look at pure classes by classes, you can kind of pick and choose, but that doesn't take into account like transfers when like say, uh, like we had a five-star running back that transferred to TCU 
which beforehand I I don't think TCU had any five star running backs. So that would give them a boost whenever you do the recalculated uh, recruiting ranks. So I'm going to be throwing that up on the research section. So go ahead and look for that. And we'll be breaking this down more in the future.